In the 1950s and 60s, the CIA began work to find means for influencing human cognition, emotion, and behavior. This research has included the use of wireless directed electromagnetic energy under the heading of information warfare and non-lethal weapons. New technological capabilities have been developed in black budget projects over the last few decades, including the ability to influence human emotion, disrupt thought, and present excruciating pain through the manipulation of magnetic fields. The U.S. military and intelligence agencies have at their disposal frightful new weapons. With the signing of the Military Commission Act of 2006, the new official U.S. policy is the torture and suspension of due process are acceptable for anyone the President deems to be a terrorist or a supporter. This act is the overt denial of the inalienable rights of human beings propagated by our Declaration of Independence and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It is imperative that the human body and mind be considered sacrosanct. To invade a person's body without their consent is an egregious human rights crime. Some of the effects of electromagnetic frequency, a burning sensation akin to touching a hot skillet over your entire body. Simultaneously, you may hear terrifying, nauseating screams, which while not produced externally, fills your brain with overwhelming thoughts of disruption and chaos. Not only are both of these phenomena currently possible, but de designs for more powerful EMF technologies receive continuous funding from the U.S. government daily. Today, the combination with the political climate and the technological capabilities presents a condition in which right, widespread manipulation of not only the flow of information through the media, but also the manipulation of the emotional states and a cognitive ability in large populations could be achieved through the use of EMF technology. Previous human rights and cognitive liberty violations are evidenced in the archives of the CIA and FBI records. One in particular is the infamous MK Ultra program and then also the grim records of harassment and subversion uncovered in the COINTELPRO program enforced in the 1950s and into the 1970s. Hello, I'm V. <laughs> Just kidding. Yes, I'm V. I am the host of the Red Pill Hardcore TV show and some other smaller productions. And I'm here today for the long awaited November 5th movie. So, the most important issue to date is technology because let's face it when you don't have an understanding of technology it can control you what you don't know absolutely has the ability to control you you know it's not like it's back in the days where People churn their own butter. Uh, these people who churn their own butter would actually know how the device worked, how to fix it if it ever broke, or even how to reproduce this device on their own if need be. Now, that's a lot more than we could say for ourselves. 
No, you can't reproduce your cell phone. Most of you can't. And so let's get into the technology and mind control. And so we have electromagnetic influences that can be pushed into the brain. Electromagnetic signals or, you know, EMF, electromagnetic fields, which everything emanates. Um, but, you know, <laughs> rather than sit here and be nerdy about this, I mean, some things just have to speak for itself. I mean, where have you seen anyone with their speech interrupted so <laughs> calculated? It's like 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 a like a robot. Have you ever seen that before? I have. And if you haven't, well, let's check it out. <laughs> states and a lawsuit against President Obama's health care reform law. Attorney General J.B. Van Hollen says Wisconsin is the latest state, including Iowa, Kansas, Maine, Ohio, and Wyoming, to join Florida's suit. The state claiming the exorcist saw on Chistrato and Blay Greenwitz by health first. Well, a very, very heavy, uh, heavy vertation tonight. We had a very Darrison Right, let's go hit Terrace chasing those for the bit to have the pit. Mark McAllister, Global News. Now, Defense Minister McCain McLeod did confirm today that more than 54 18 fighter jets are spending about as much as 20 and ready to assist the 600 100 deployed over the amount needed. Now, it did depend that how the NOLAN emerges RN while the university or the UN mission as whole received support from all batteries in the hues of the, the garbage uh, of today. Excuse me. Uh, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you, Mark McAllister from Japan tonight. Předpokládat, že odpoledne pravdy budeme úspěšnější. A teď se pojďme podívat na to, co přines, přinesly po poslední hodiny na české, čes, české politické scéně. Hi. Yes, like they say in Catholic school, leave room for the Holy Ghost. <laughs> anyway, there is a lot of uh, memories today, actually. It's a big day in music history. 
75 years ago today, Elvis Presley passed away, the king of rock and roll. And as Mark Cohn says in his great song, Walking in Memphis, there. <laughs> anyway, there is a lot of uh, memories today, actually. It's a big day in music history. So as you can see, when the trigger word, Holy Spirit, is said, he immediately freezes up and starts to be very weird. As you can see, he's, there's no reactions. He's staring blankly into the camera as if he is completely disassociated. In the MK Ultra Mind Control Program, one of the things that they need to do is create a psychological state of disassociation. Here we see that right in front of our eyes. He's completely disassociated from reality in what's called a trance. That is part of the mind control program. It's to get the person to a point where they're in trances and they're controllable. So here she's jumping in and out of uh, a child personality. That's one of the programs that they will put in the individual is a child program. So here she's jumping from one personality to another. Uh, because she's a victim of mind control, but the media wants you to believe that these people are either uh, using drugs or are just psychologically breaking down. We need to be very careful. The media is here to lie to us. If you were relying on TMZ and the mainstream media to tell you the truth, you're going to get stuff like this. Goading them, like when he just stared creepily into the camera for what seemed like eternity. 35 years ago today, Elvis Presley passed away. Huh? <laughs> yeah. So they admit that, you know, he's staring in the camera, uh, weird, it's strange, it's a strange thing that he's doing, they admit that, uh, but what they do is try and tell you that he's doing this, not because of MK Ultra mind control uh, program, that the synagogue of Satan in it is administering onto individuals who want to take part in being used uh, in the establishment of the Antichrist kingdom, no, they don't tell you that, they tell you that this is occurring, uh, because he's trying to start trouble on the set. Just nonsense. It's pretty ridiculous when uh, you know what's really going on and you see how they try and cover themselves. So be very vigilant. The mainstream media is constantly, constantly lying to us. Okay, so this is what's going on. It's an MK Ultra mind control operation uh, that uh, is being used by Hollywood to uh, just keep people uh, doing what they need them to do. It's a lot easier to control their puppets when they are literally under mind control. So they're not going to get uh, too much objection or problems, uh, you know, dealing with someone who can be put into a trance and used to do just about anything. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was in a trance! Yeah, what the drill there, huh? Bad news for the Obama administration. Uh, we have this new CNN ORC poll, which is quite a quite a uh, turnaround in that. In, uh... But voters will have the last word on Trump. Happy Media New Year. Brian Stelter, CNN, New York. Brian, thank you so much. And for all of you on Twitter who are asking if I'm okay, thank you so much. I got a little hot and I, I passed out for a moment. I am fine. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. I got a little hot and I, I passed out for a moment. I am fine. And I figured that would never happen without the, the uh, preparation we had draining the team and sideline. Wait, that's a little embarrassing. <laughs> but so I don't get people worried standing up here too long. Thing what I was gonna say, and so I figured I could stand here standing enough. It's a challenge.
as much as I would like to laugh at those past few scenes, I, I, I can't, uh, knowing what's actually going on. I mean, I guess it's time to get serious here. If you can ascertain the importance of these news reports, these news reports were not very flattering, what they had to say about, you know, what's going on in, in politics. Uh, and so I can understand why someone would want to stop these reporters from talking or delivering their story. Uh, from a censorship standpoint, for those of you who don't understand what these people were hit with, what these reporters were influenced by, you gotta brush up on your covert warfare history. And the Cold War, psychotronic weapons were in fact developed. Psychotronic, today they're called directed energy weapons. And this actually, this dominates mainstream media. Operation Mockingbird is very, very alive and well. The CIA has information on lock. They don't want you to see it. Most of the time, this information doesn't get out. But, you know, how could this really be done though? Some people always want to talk about implants. So let's go into the whole idea of implants. Uh, implantable human chips. Supporters hail the technology as a medical marvel, but critics warn that the potential risks are real. Well, they talked about, for example, electrical hazards. This thing is by no means inert. The, w the way it works is it actually picks up and amplifies ambient electromagnetic energy from the reader devices. And if you have one of these things in your arm and you get within range of a, a powerful electromagnetic field, it can actually burn you. Oh, and by the way, it can kill you if you get out of line. <laughs> a closer look at the who and the why behind this idea. All right, this next story may sound like something out of, uh, well, a Hollywood thriller. A Saudi inventor has created a killer microchip. It's designed to track terrorists and criminals and, well, you can think of somebody. Not only does it include a GPS device, it also has a lethal dose of cyanide, which can be activated at any time. You get my point? The inventor's bid for a patent has been rejected in Germany. Joining us now this morning to talk about it, Jake Ward, deputy editor of Popular Science. Okay, this is pretty macabre, pretty uh, sinister and nefarious. How exactly would this work? Well, there's a, a category of technology uh, that involves GPS tracking systems being shrunk down to the size where you could actually implant it surgically. And we've seen a number of applications for this. Um, this is without question the most sinister version of it that I've certainly heard of. Um, you know, and, and the notion of tracking criminals is not new, but the notion of killing them remotely, I think, is, is a whole new thing. Yeah, and Germany says, look, we're, we're not going to approve this That's because right. for that very purpose. And apparently, in some of the paperwork and applying for the patent, you know, you could track fugitives from justice, terrorists, illegal immigrants, criminals, political opponents, defectors, and Saudi Arabians who don't re return home from pilgrimage. It's a, it's a little bit wild. I agree. I mean, the, the thing about, uh, uh, you know, this kind of patent is it, Germany has very tight laws about making sure that you, you're not registering something that really is just a, 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 a bad idea, a scary idea. And in this case, this guy obviously has some very strong feelings about what it would be used for, but it just seems a little outlandish. Yeah, well, terrorist groups might be interested. I'm sure they'd be happy to grant their own form of a patent sure. for that. As fun as the idea of being implanted with microchips are, that's actually not how it works. Um, 
as far as mind control or anything like that is concerned. I, <laughs> not to get too much back into the conspiracy realm because I'm just speaking the facts. Uh, I always speak the facts because so I research. Journalist, researcher, uh, I, I wear many hats. So conspiracy theorists is not one of them. Now, the CIA definitely used to kidnap lots of people, you know, getting black bagged and implanting them for mind control. So with that said, people started complaining about the radio signals and these sort of things and microchips have been found in people, lots of people. Now, people have been brainwashed into thinking they were abducted by aliens. <sighs> That's a whole other documentary by itself, by the way. But back to the point, this is not how it's done anymore. People can't understand that you're not microchipped, target individuals who swear up and down that you're microchipped, I would say about 90, 99% of you are not microchipped. It, I mean, it really depends on your age. For you older individuals out there, there's a few of you floating out there with CIA microchips in you. But it's not how it's done today. See, we're all nano-chipped. Then how many electrodes would you have to stick into your brain, though? None. None? Surely you're joking. You go in from the inside. And so the possibility occurred, occurred to me, actually, that it would be uh, very intriguing uh, to use the holes that are already present in the brain to get to the brain without actually having to go through the skull. Rodolfo Linas is really one of the giants uh, in the field of neuroscience. I have friends that actually are neuroscientists and uh, when they heard that I was working with Rodolfo, uh, you know, I couldn't believe it actually. They said, wow, you know, how, you know, how is that possible? And the, the holes that I'm talking about uh, the holes produced by the fact that the brain has vessels which basically bring oxygen to the brain may be used as pathways into the brain. Essentially we are going to make wires that are smaller than the diameter of blood cells and we're going to thread them up through the vascular system from a catheter that's been inserted in your leg all the way up into your brain into the smallest capillaries, the smallest blood vessels there, where the electrodes can be very close to the nerve cells in your brain without requiring major surgery to open your skull up and shove the electrodes into the surface. So 500 nanometer, 500 nanometer is very small. If you think of it, that's about, um, you know, 100 times less uh, uh, than the thickness of your hair. How do you push the electrode to the brain? So what you do is you actually send a certain number of them, a bundle, and then the bundle uh, would, uh, would be, the nanowires would be allowed to, to float into the uh, uh, bloodstream until they can go no further. At the moment we can wire a rat. We can uh, leave the, uh, the electrodes in the spinal cord. We want to know if we do so, how long do the wires continue to work properly. We're talking about uh, five years worth of very basic research that needs to be done. I implement something known as man-machine interface. If you can simulate the brain, you can simulate vision, you can simulate auditory cortex, you can stimulate movement, uh, you can stimulate um, uh, the passions, you can simulate uh, desires, you can um, basically address your brain directly. What else can you do? Well, uh, you can, of course, in, in principle, communicate with another person directly. Not only just your thoughts, but in principle, your feelings. 
So if you can get very close to somebody, you can get into their minds, and vice versa. Now, the implications of that are pretty obvious. It may be a mutual situation, or it may be one direction. Somebody gets into your brain, into your mind. The National Security Agency, the NSA, visited us. And these guys are, they sort of have a mystique being members of the intelligence community. You know, the people who came are very smart. They're dressed in suits that cost more than I make in a year. I think some of their interest is potentially sinister. So, pure fantasy, you can imagine a, a, a group of people doing a job, people doing a job in, in the military, uh, becoming continuously aware of their existence and what they're doing. So suddenly you have not a human, but a group of people they, that behave as a single entity. We could call this something like a wolf pack. You would have a collective consciousness, a collective understanding. You would be basically a rather strange new device. We'll be able to do things in that we can't even imagine right now in so little time that one person could do the work of 20. But at the same time, there are other concerns. If we're able to interface directly with the brain this way, what's to say that the device you're using isn't reading your mind or controlling it? So I think there's a delicate balance that has to be made between how much, the how much any device that we connect to the brain is there to help us and how much it's there to monitor or control us. We should be controlling things. Things should not be controlling us. The, the downside is, of course, very clear. You uh, begin to lose your individuality. You will be evolving into a rather different social entity. At the moment, we negotiate. At the moment, uh, our relations are mostly uh, saying what we want other people to, to hear. We think other people and we, of course, hide many aspects of what we're thinking. That's, in fact, the basis for politics, the basis for, for negotiations of any type. It is, therefore, very important for some people not to be totally transparent. I think that's going to be a big change in the way we interact with reality. The idea of being able to wire people's brains together in this way to give us the ability to directly beam our thoughts to one another sounds like science fiction. It really does. But basically right now, we have proof of concept of a number of these things. I mean, man-machine interface obviously is one of the things that is going to happen. Absolutely. I want you guys not to have a complete and total freak out because it's not that time to freak out quite yet. I'm not done giving up the information. But I want to take a, a, a little bit of a break here in this information because they're going to be chemtrail deniers. They, they actually exist. People who can look up into the sky, see the chemtrails, and say that they're not there. Enjoy this clip. One of the conspiracy theories that just won't seem to quit is this idea that's out there that the government is spraying chemicals out of the backside of airplanes to control the population or change the climate or test weapons or infuse us all with Viagra or create a race of half human, half monkey hybrids. I don't know, there's a lot of different theories. It's easy to generate all these different theories when you have no evidence to base any of this on. And that idea is out there, and it's called chemtrails. These uh, contrails in the air of white evaporated materials and that sort of thing. People believe there are sinister uh, uh, backgrounds to it. A lot of people, a lot of people believe that these are real. In fact, 17% of respondents back in 2011 in an international survey said they believed the existence of a secret large-scale atmospheric spraying program to be true or partly true. 17%, that is literally millions and millions of Americans, believing that it exists without any evidence whatsoever. However, 
It turns out that people reading conspiracy theory websites aren't the only ones with information to bear on this subject. There are actually scientists who study this sort of thing, who study the atmosphere, and now there's a study to leverage their expertise. The study, published by Environmental Research Letters, found that the two groups of experts surveyed, atmospheric chemists who specialize in condensation trails, and geochemists working on atmospheric deposition of dust and pollution overwhelmingly rejected the notion that such a program exists. Out of 77 participating scientists, 76 said they found zero evidence of a secret spraying program, adding that any evidence supposedly cited by those who subscribe to the chemtrail theory could be explained away by poor data sampling and or normal contrail. The Republicans uh, have had some real knuckleheads as the head of the House Committee on Science, Space, and Technology. Now, the last one was actually a guy named Ralph Hall. He was, of course, from Texas. And he had these brilliant things to say. Uh, why does he think that uh, human beings have not contributed to climate change? He said, well, that's because, quote, he doesn't think we can control what God controls. Well, uh, there you have it. That's the guy that was the head of the science committee. I don't know, man. I've I, rockets going up into space and NASA. Well, God controls that. We can't control that. I don't know what you're talking about, right? I mean, under that logic, doesn't God control everything? So you shouldn't just pack up the whole committee, which probably they would love. Ralph Hall also said, "Hey, that he wasn't worried about global warming." He said, "Quote: I'm really more fearful of freezing." Okay, <laughs> but how does that relate to the rest of us? <laughs> and he said, I'm also afraid of stinks on a plane. <laughs> and then one day he said, hey, wait a minute, you're afraid of freezing, but what difference does that make to the rest of us? He said, well, quote, I don't have any science to prove that. <laughs> In other words, my concerns about global freezing are unfounded. By the way, I am at the head of the science committee. But don't worry, guys, because we have a new head of the science committee after the elections. And it's this gentleman. No, this gentleman. <laughs> His name is Lamar Smith. He's going to be a lot more reasonable. So uh, I'm sure he believes in science. 98% of the scientists believe in climate change and that it is that human beings are contributing to it. Well, so let's find out if that's the case. This is him talking about so called climate gate and the media coverage of it. Their reporting was largely slanted in favor of global warming alarmists. The networks have shown a steady pattern of bias on climate change. During a six-month period, four out of five network news reports failed to acknowledge any dissenting views about global warming, according to a Business and Media Institute study. The network should tell Americans the truth rather than hide the facts. So, he is not concerned about global warming or climate change. He's concerned that uh, the networks are not covering the 2% of bought scientists enough. The ones that represent the oil industry and the gas and coal industries. And, uh, you know, these scientists, they're probably making all this stuff up. And the new head of the science committee. Now, why does Lamar Smith think that's up? Well, I might, want to, might have a couple ideas as to why he would think that. For example, last year he received $10,000 from Coke Industries. Now remember, these guys are bought off fairly cheaply. It's always shocking how little gets them to change their vote. Uh, but that's not as big a deal as what he has received over his career from oil and gas industry, which is $500,000. So this is how the Republican Party works. You pay us bribes, and in return, we put in charge of the Science, Space, and Technology Committee guys who do not believe in science or technology and probably don't even believe in space. Our politics is so corrupt, it's crazy. We hamper the ability to create new jobs. Yeah, so that's um, why I'm asking you to stop and think, and what is the conservative solution to this? Let, let, let me ask you, President Obama on November 14th said temperatures around the globe, or the temperature around the globe is increasing faster than was predicted even 10 years ago. Yet, a article in The Economist in March 2013, and I quote, said temperatures have not really risen over the last 10 years. A month earlier, the BBC News reported that since 1998, there has been an unexplained standstill in the heating of the Earth's atmosphere. This is largely correct, right? That energy, that temperatures have remained flat over the last 10, 15 years. No, the rate of, of increase has been lower. 
and it's not unexplained. The, there's a natural Pacific decadal oscillation, and the Pacific uh, tropical temperature has not warmed during that okay, period, and that's affected the global temperature. Said. Well, let me ask just a final question. Uh, uh, Mr. Bruin, uh, Dr. Hanson, are you both familiar with a fellow named Patrick Moore? Yes. So he was the founder of Greenpeace, correct? And uh, disavowed by them three decades ago. Well, he's disavowing them as well. He said that he's, uh, uh, he left the group because uh, he said the group became more interested in politics than science and had taken a sharp turn to the political left. But he made the statement, he said, we do not know whether the present pause in temperature will remain for some time or whether it will go up or down at some time in the near future. What we do know with extreme certainty is that climate is always changing between pauses and that we are not capable with our limited knowledge are predicting which way it will go next. I, I, I live in Wisconsin. You know, th there were two, I think, 200 foot thick glaciers in Wisconsin. W w how do you explain that the it's climate a, it's change a, before, before a, man ever had a carbon footprint? How, how do you explain the statement that, that you change? just made is blatantly false? How do you we do explain, know. We do. How, how do you explain climate change that occurred 10,000 years ago before man had a carbon print? Oh. Carbon <laughs> how do you explain Cli that? Cli climate. Uh, th there are. There are. Uh, variations in the Earth's orbital elements, the eccentricity of the Earth's orbit, the time in the season at which it's closest to the sun. So and, those variations just end right now, so now it's all man-made? No, uh, no one has said just, it is just, all man-made. Well, there there that, are natural... Kind of the, the, the tact that most however, take. the man-made effect is now dominant. And we can measure that because we can measure the energy balance of the planet. And we see that there's more energy coming in and it is going out. So therefore, the planet is going to continue to get warmer. It doesn't mean each year is going to get warmer, because there are natural fluctuations. But this decade is going to be warmer than the last one, and the following one will be still warmer. I, 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 agree, I agree with Ms. Harbert. I think the, set, the science is far from settled. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Another example is the array of technologies, often referred to collectively as geoengineering that potentially could help reverse the warming effects of global climate change. One that has gained my personal attention is stratospheric aerosol injection, or SAI. A method of seeding the stratosphere with particles that can help reflect the sun's heat in much the same way that volcanic eruptions do. An SAI program could limit global temperature increases, reducing some risks associated with higher temperatures and providing the world economy additional time to transition from fossil fuels. This process is also relatively inexpensive. The National Research, Research Council estimates that a fully deployed SAI program would cost about $10 billion yearly. As promising as it may be, moving forward on SAI would also raise a number of challenges for our government and for the international community. On the technical side, greenhouse gas emission reductions would still have to accompany SAI to address other climate change effects, such as ocean acidification, because SAI alone would not remove greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. On the geopolitical side, the technology's potential to alter weather patterns and benefit certain regions of the world at the expense of other regions could trigger sharp opposition by some nations. Others might seize on SAI's benefits and back away from their commitment to carbon dioxide reductions. And as with other breakthrough technologies, Global norms and standards are lacking to guide the deployment and implementation of SAI and other geoengineering initiatives. Now, I could go on and on and on and on about the things that fascinate me, but rather than talk about them, I thought I'd stop here. Hey, you guys want to know what causes global warming? I'm going to tell you, it doesn't take a genius to figure that one out. Yeah, and hey, if you ask me who this guy was at the beginning of that clip, this talk show host, or if that's what he was, if you ask me who he is, I don't know. I have no idea. I just ran across that absurdity and I had to blanket that video over the evidence that he said that did not exist. Uh, <laughs> and 
the CIA director at the end who actually came out and admitted that chemtrails existed. Okay, it, it exists. Even though it's 20 years later, 20 years later, I've been looking at these chemtrails for actually over 20 years. I've noticed them being sprayed when I was six years old. Okay, I don't need the CIA director to validate my reality for me. How about you? But I know some of you think that nano particulates are science fiction, nanotechnology is science fiction. Well, anyone can synthesize nanotechnology, nanoparticulates. You can do it in your own garage. You've got the right equipment. Uh, this this guy did it. Since high school, I've been fascinated by carbon nanotubes and have been trying to grow them. There are loads of papers that talk about using a high amperage arc between two graphite rods to generate the carbon nanotubes. In fact, this is one of the first ways they were readily synthesized and how I initially tried to make them back in high school. Most methods require the arc be made in a partial vacuum with helium. And I tried this, but since I was unable to adjust the rods, I couldn't strike the initial arc, and I was worried that if, even if I could, it could cause the chamber to shatter and implode. Then I stumbled onto a paper that talked about the same procedure, but they performed it in deionized water, just in air. This struck me as being far easier, so I decided to give it a try. I built a little stand using PVC and used one of my rewound microwave oven transformers to generate the high current. This turned out to be a major dud. There wasn't nearly enough amperage, so the arc it produced was tiny. And while I'm sure that some carbon nanotubes probably formed, the amount was so minuscule that it wasn't enough to care about. So I rewound another transformer to be a bit higher voltage, and this worked much better. I could see a spot on the rods that are noticeably darker, and an iridescent film formed on the surface of the rod. In an attempt to debunk this conspiracy theory as I thought it was, I didn't debunk it. It literally changed my life. Um, like I said, this is hard for me because it's not easy standing here and telling my story. Uh, can you go into the details of exactly what you saw? Yeah, basically to summarize it, part of my job was to know everything that was going on in the military and what that might, what type of impact that might have on human health and then the environmental aspects and impacts. What chemicals are we using? How are we disposing of it? Kind of cradle to grave. 
So we were the internal um, compliance people for following OSHA and EPA standards. Uh, one part of that process was to approve chemicals, hazardous materials, you know, what are you using, why do you need it, where is it being used, and tracking that disposal. Um, after it being brought to my attention about chemtrails or geoengineering, I, I used to think it was crazy. It actually was disrespectful to my line of work because here we are trying to prevent environmental aspects and impacts um, and not have anybody get sick from our operations. But in, in an attempt to debunk I it changed my life. I started noticing things. I started noticing large quantities on the system where I would approve chemicals that did not have a manufacturer name, wasn't tied to a building, and that, that was normal protocol. When I started asking questions, um, I slowly became demonized. Um, a couple years passed after that when I asked again and people realized I was kind of being more vocal about it on social media. I was starting to be thrown into a mental institution and have my daughter taken away. That changed my life. I no longer view the military the same way, and I feel like after nine years of trying to uphold an oath, I'm able to do that now. The true purpose for chemtrails? Well, I think they actually might be trying to synthesize an element that already exists. Magnetite is a mineral, one of the three common naturally occurring iron oxides. It is the most magnetic of all the naturally occurring minerals on Earth. Naturally magnetized pieces of magnetite, called lodestone, will attract small pieces of iron, and this is how ancient people first noticed the property of magnetism. Biomagnetism is usually related to the presence of crystals of magnetite, which occur widely in organisms. These organisms range from bacteria to animals, where these crystals are found in the brain. These crystals are involved in magnetoception, the ability to sense the polarity or the inclination of the Earth's magnetic fields and aid in navigation of migratory animals. Magnetoception is the sense which allows an organism to detect a magnetic field to perceive direction, altitude, or location. This is an example of the homing pigeon who can return to its home by using its ability to sense the Earth's magnetic field. Humans have an impact on so many aspects of the Earth's ecology. While wrangling with the magnetic field might seem like an activity that is out of our reach, human-induced electromagnetic noise could be a concern for migrating animals. Magnetite the strongest naturally magnetic material on Earth. It's already been shown that Trout's facial nerves respond to electric signals when exposed to magnetic fields. So, the German team scraped some cells out of a rainbow trout's nose and put them in a microscope surrounded by magnetic coils and a rotating magnetic field. What they found is that some cells, maybe one in 10,000, actually spun in unison with the rotating magnetic field. These cellular magnets are tiny, but they responded to the magnetic field with about 100 times more force than the researchers predicted. The researchers theorized that these compass cells contain microscopic crystals of magnetite, or maybe some other iron-rich mineral, and that nearby nerve cells pick up their spinning and transmit that information to the fish's brain to give it directions. Very clever. Very interesting. I think we got to go a little bit deeper into that. This article is entitled Magnetite, the Great Pyramid, and the order of our universe. I'm going to scroll down to start reading and it says this. In 1992, Dr. Joseph Kirschfink of Caltech published findings that the human brain cells possess a highly magnetic mineral known as magnetite. He believed that this magnetite allowed for animals from bees to whales to navigate the Earth's magnetic field. After researching human brain tissue, he found that most regions of the brain have 5 million magnetite crystals per gram, while the tough membrane that covers the brain had 100 million crystals per gram. It is estimated that every brain on average has 7 billion magnetite crystals, weighing a total of about 1 millionth of an ounce. He also found that magnetite interacts over a million times more strongly with the external magnetic fields than any other biological material including iron in red blood cell. What I propose is that we are affected profoundly by our environment and we do process invisible light energy via these magnetite crystals in our brain. 
What's also occurring is that the planetary magnetic field is changing substantially. The resonant frequency of the Earth has shifted significantly in recent years after remaining constant for as long as scientists have been able to measure. Therefore, is it likely that we will reorient our consciousness via the change in input to these magnetite crystals in our brain? And he also says the pineal gland, which is located roughly at the center of your head, has an abundance of magnetite crystals. The glandular structure is believed to be the receiving point of the higher mind and has been revered in subtle ways throughout history. Dr. H. Coetzee, PhD, and he is the leader in this field in the study. And I want to read what he says right here. It says, in the human brain, pyramidal cells are present and arranged in layers in the cortex of the two cerebra. The pyramidal cells act as an electrocrystal cells immersed in extracellular tissue fluids and seem to operate in the fashion of a liquid crystal oscillator in response to different light commands or light pulses, which in turn change the orientation of every molecule and atom within the body. So what are the implications here? We know that we're being nanochipped. So what are the implications for frequency technology? All control and signal processing electronics is contained within the radar unit requiring only a PC or PDA as the user interface and image display. This unique electronic beam scanning technology provides up to 360 degree horizontal coverage with no moving parts, offering high reliability, configuration flexibility and covert operation. High resolution plus integral GPS receiver and digital compass provide discrimination of multiple targets and accurate overlay onto a map database. A typical terrain would otherwise return a radar image which was of no use to surveillance applications, as shown in this display. But by introducing clutter filtering, the static objects are suppressed, leaving a clear display of all moving targets. False alarms due to adverse weather conditions and animals are minimized by adjustable sensitivity thresholds and Doppler filtering. Location, speed and direction of travel are identified by combining the radar data with the inbuilt GPS receiver and digital compass and once highlighted by the blighter radar, targets can be inspected by a security camera. The Doppler frequency shift induced by moving targets can be used to differentiate various target types. The distinct audible whine from a vehicle target, with its high frequency content, is readily distinguishable from the more rhythmic tone from a human target. This may be sub-audible at slow speed, yet still identifiable electronically. These differing sounds can be interpreted by the operator or by an automatic target recognition system. The blue background image is the clutter map caused by static objects such as buildings and trees. Moving objects are clearly displayed, each color coded according to its speed and with a facility to show the track of the target over a period of time. Optimized for easy, semi-skilled operation, there is a comprehensive set of menus that can be configured by the system manager. The clutter map may be suppressed to more clearly highlight the moving targets. Touchscreen zoom and pan controls enable inspection of key target areas. 
Targets may be selected to display data on their range, bearing, velocity, and typical size, all very useful for the categorizing of the target type. Key to target identification is the Doppler shift caused by its motion, and selecting a target of interest enables the operator to listen to this audio signature and identify the various target types. Alert zones can be introduced around critical areas, such that an alarm is triggered if an object moves into them. Here we define an alert zone at a crossroad junction, and as a vehicle enters the zone, it changes colour and an audible alarm is triggered to alert the operator. Scanning enable a wide range of fixed installations and easy integration on security observation towers alongside cameras and lighting equipment. So, the technology that the government has, well, it's not being used for anything good. No terrorists have been caught, no crime has been stopped, no terrorist attacks, no shootings, no, no anything. So, this huge drain on the American people who pay their taxes, uh, what gives this for besides creating totalitarian big brother state? Well, that's the question. And in my research, I have found the answers. So if she said the future out loud, the future, we have the signal that's corresponding to that muscular activity. But with some vocal speech, she doesn't have to move her mouth. She could say that word silently. So if she would say the future silently. Here she said the future, but she didn't move her lips. And you can see that there is still the same signal being picked up by the electrodes underneath her throat. Once the electrodes capture the signal, they can be transmitted, as if through a cell phone, to someone with an earpiece receiver. In Chicago, Illinois, a world authority on microwave hearing shows how it could work. I'm hearing a microwave pulse like a click. Now it sounds like a, a chirp. With a tone of quality to it. Professor James Lynn is hearing sounds that aren't there, but he's not crazy. Pulses of microwave energy are being generated and fired at him from behind. Microwaves can be heard depending on the individual, uh, depending on the hearing acu acuity of the individual. Individuals with uh, fairly normal hearing can hear microwaves at a quite a low level. The energy of the absorbed microwaves causes brain tissue to very slightly heat up and expand, causing a pressure wave to be picked up by the hearing mechanism in the inner ear. Professor Lin is far from hearing voices, but it could be possible to send coded signals to an agent this way. Brain is an electrical organ. Uh, it is uh, susceptible to electrical signals. Since the microwave is electrical, therefore, in principle, one could uh, embed or encode information in the microwaves. There have been recent advances in acoustic technology which can transmit sound great distances with a very narrow target range. The long-range acoustic device is one such technology and is currently employed by both military and commercial sea vessels to deter potential attackers. In San Diego, California, Woody Norris, developer of the LRAD, describes another of his acoustic technologies known as hypersonic sound. It's kind of like uh, radio stations, except in this case, you don't need a receiver. To hear a radio station, I gotta have a receiver. With this, the mixing actually happens in the air, 
and you hear it without any other device. So if I aim it at you and it happens to hit both of your ears, and I'm reluctant to say this, it'll be as though the sound is inside your head. This time I'll come all the way around in case you're getting a lot of echo from the room. The observation of the phenomena came way back during the uh, Second World War, and the, uh, the radar operators you know, accidentally noticed that when they stand in front of the uh, uh, radar, sometimes they can hear uh, clicks in their head. Uh, somebody by the name of uh, Alan Fry who had talked to some of the radar operators based on their uh, report, and he conducted a very simple uh, laboratory experiment, indeed showed that human beings can hear the radar pulses. They were not just in making it up. In ordinary uh, sound perception, sound that goes into the uh, ear canal gets amplified by the small bones in the middle ear and then gets to the inner ear where the cochlea resides and in the cochlea is converted to electrical impulse. But fundamentally the physical phenomena that enables it is mechanical movement of particles. So the mechanical wave transmitted by the bones of the middle ear gets converted at the inner ear into the uh, electrical impulses. Two, three, two, one. But in the case of a micro, the auditory effect is the source is electromagnetic. So if you expose the biological tissue to a pulse of uh, microwave energy, the tissue expands and induces a vibration. Instead of going through the middle ear, the microwave-induced vibration gets propagated to the inner ear directly, and at the inner ear, is converted to electrical impulses again. One, two, three, two, three. And in this case, and the vibration in the human tissue, if the tissue is the head, for example, will fall within the auditory range of a human uh, subject. People now are talking about, actually, uh, direct communication like we mentioned, uh, sending a message uh, you know, through the air to a person without anybody else uh, being aware of it. That is within the realm of possibility. I don't know whether it is true or not. I think uh, there are a sizable number of people who think this is being used for mind control. I think if somebody who wants to do it, there is the potential. D.C. police have recently had to deal with some crowd control situations involving violent teenagers. Now a controversial noise device just may do some work for them. Let's find out more from our own Brian Todd. Brian. Well, if this gallery place section of Washington is very popular with young people because of all the trendy bars and restaurants around here, but recently property managers have complained about loitering. Property managers have placed this device up on the wall right next to the metro station. This is called a mosquito. It emits a high-pitched sound designed to keep loiterers away. But the question is, does it unfairly target young people? It can cause a high-pitched headache and that's by design. Just outside the Gallery Place subway stop in Washington, the mosquito beeps often. But is it indiscriminate? This anti-loitering device was placed here after a big street brawl. But the property managers and the mosquito's distributor both tell CNN the noisemaker doesn't target young people. Still, the distributor says teenagers happen to do the most loitering. And he says the sound is most effective for the stage of life when humans can hear the highest pitches. The mosquito, uh, when activated, emits a sound at 17.5 kilohertz, which is at the high end of the uh, youth uh, hearing range, uh, 13 to 25 year old hearing range. When, when a youth hears the sound, they find it extremely annoying and will leave the area in a few minutes. At Gallery Place, we saw some young people getting irritated. I probably wouldn't shop at any of these shops if I heard it again. Why not? It's just, it's too annoying. It's just, it gave me a headache. 
There are settings on the Mosquito that can be heard by older age groups. I played the sound off a computer in our newsroom near several people in their 20s, 30s, and older. I didn't tip them off beforehand. On settings for people 25, 30, 35, and younger, no one reacted. Then, we're going to play a setting now for people 50 years old and under. I can hear that too. Still, some believe this device does target teenagers unfairly. Among the community leaders who have concerns about this device, Judith Sandalow of the Children's Law Center here in the Gallery Place area. Judith, if there are problems with violence and loiterers driving away customers from businesses that count on that business in this area, wouldn't any little thing like this help? I'm sympathetic to businesses needing to be able to um, engage the most customers in the best possible way. I'm sympathetic to that. This isn't the best solution. Uh, we need to have better programs for youth. We need to engage them in activities. Believe it or not, young people have been able to use this device to their advantage. We're told by the distributor that that high-pitched sound that it emits has made its way onto the internet. He says that young people have been able to download that noise onto their cell phones to use as ringtones so that when their cell phones ring, they can hear it, but their parents and their teachers cannot. <laughs> now time for On Cape from the newsroom of the Cape Cod Times in Hyannis, Massachusetts. And today we're talking about a teen repellent that's called the mosquito. It's an interesting story. And joining us from the Cape Cod Times is Sean Gonzalez. Hi, Sean. Hey, Leslie. I, I had never heard of this. Uh, what is the mosquito? <laughs> a mosquito is this piece of technology. It's like a little speaker box. And uh, Marjorie and uh, Sparrow, and Bob Sparrow, her husband, who owns this hot chocolate sparrow down here, they heard it on the NPR, the show, about a year ago, where it emits this frequency that you have to be between the ages of 12 and 25 to hear, apparently. Uh, apparently, as, as you get older, I mean, this isn't really a surprise, I guess, if you think about it, but as you get older, certain frequencies are inaudible to older people. And so it, it, it plays this frequency and it only extends out about 30 to 50 feet, they say. It pl they play it for a few minutes, and apparently it drives teenagers crazy, and it drives them away. Because it's an unpleasant sound. Right, the screeching sound, kind of like nails on a chalkboard, I, I guess. I mean, I may look a little young, but I'm, I'm too old to hear it. I can't hear it. <laughs> it could be playing right now. I couldn't hear it either, so. Uh, what's the point? To keep... I assume they want business, so when do they turn this thing they, on? They do. They say that they only turn it on after 11 when they close, and they're there for about an hour afterwards. This, this parking lot is a hangout spot for, for teenagers after hours sometimes. They, the police have said that they've had as many as three dozen teenagers hanging out. They've had some incidences of vandalism and things like that. So um, the owners claim that they, you know, they haven't used it in a few months, but they, but they play it at night just to keep people away after hours. Um, and apparently it doesn't project into the store and it doesn't affect young, young ears or older ears. So, but you know, huh. here on the Cape, it's one of these stories that I'm sure people will talk about because it sort of adds to this, uh, what young people would say is this unfriendly environment. There's a couple of towns on Cape where things close between one and three, whether it's off-road vehicles or hanging out, you know, mm -hmm. it, th there always seems to be this effort to, to shoot people along. Although the Cape Cod Mall says, hey, we want you guys to come. Come hang out in the mall, of course. They're not going to put up a mosquito. Is it legal? What does the police department have to say about it? Well, the police department was surprised. Apparently, it is legal. Um, the, the company that makes it Kids Be Gone, they say that it has no harmful effects. The, the Orleans police chief actually said he knew nothing about it, but that he, it, it helped explain why they weren't getting as many calls to the parking lot at night. Kids Be Gone is the company. <laughs> That's right. They're out of England. That's interesting. And so adults wouldn't even know when the thing is turned on. They'd have to ask a group of teenagers. Right. And, you know, this technology, you know, it kind of, you know, it's a, it's a two-edged sword. Kids may get annoyed by it, but on the other hand, apparently there's these uh, cell phone ringtones that you can download, young people can download, that only they can hear ring. So it, Why isn't it, that convenient? So it, the yeah, parents exactly. don't even know when the phone's ringing. Yep. <laughs> We're getting old, Sean. That's what it is. So, very disturbing stuff. Fusion centers, and among other different types of agencies, working together, these are the people who are responsible for targeted individuals. They're responsible for the tenfold hack conspiracy. Okay. Voices in people's heads. This is actually old CIA technology. 
very old. Uh, 1970s old. And I'm very disturbed because I went deeper into my research and connected the dots. These people, I, I, I hate to call them people, they're really just psychopathic flesh bots. People who lack any character, who feel superior to you and want to sit above you when they are the lowliest scum on the planet. These people are using this type of technology for their child sex rings. Sounds that only children can hear. Any any age group, they're, they're, they're letting you know, okay? You ever wonder why a lot of children don't speak out? I guess they're molesters. They're being harassed with voice to skull technologies, constant voices in their heads if they choose to speak out. A lot of people have actually come up underneath this sort of program. Children, sex slaves to government officials military and in uh, politics are undergoing torture from voice to skull. Because after all, uh, parents and teachers can't hear this noise. So, victims suppressed. Information about the victims suppressed. I wonder how many children who have listened to these voices have gone and picked up a gun, given directions to go and pick up mommy or daddy's gun out of the closet or wherever, instructed to load the gun and kill themselves with it all for sake of gun control. These government officials, these government agents, these gov the whole system has a hand in this. It's disgusting. The nanoparticulates in the air that you breathe coats your brain and your entire nervous system. This allows for all kinds of remote biotelemetry. They can track you by these nanotransceivers that upon various frequency bombardment can ping back information about your heart rate, breathing patterns, and even what you're thinking. These particles that now lace all of our brains for the sake of brain mapping acts as artificial magnetites which enhance synthetic telepathy. Stun guns and EMP devices don't work to destroy these little nanoparticulates like computer chip implants. Instead they operate by magnetic energy that store and have information moved through EMF fields via covert scalar wave inquiry. Our brains at this point are much like computer hard drives. Information is stored magnetically. ELF magnetic resonance or brain waves are emitted by all living creatures. The aluminum in the chemtrails act as superconductors or antennas and the barium acts as signal boosting electrolytes interfacing where information can be queried. Much like quantum computing, these nanoparticles are all in the form of crystals. This works on the science of piezomagnetics. A person is bombarded with interferometry fields or beam signals intersecting areas that 
break down to electromagnetic static that could normally not be detected because it reads as the same level of energy that the earth puts off and up to the same 60 hertz that every electrical device puts off. That's how the governments get away with putting voices into people's heads. I suggest you people look up scalar wave energy. Also, zero point energy, which is only possible to be created in a vacuum tube or in outer space. Satellite mind control. This is basically free energy. Someone being targeted by the government could be electronically harassed their whole lives and it would cost but a few pennies for electrical wear and tear on the machine components. No thought is private. This is government remote neural monitoring. And in the case of those being targeted with voices, computer AI with neuro-linguistic patterning learning programs in their heads, it's satellite terrorism. These people end up being chemically lobotomized, committing suicide, or killing lots of people. New World Order governments have been spraying chemtrails, or neural dust, for at least a decade prior to 9-11 and placed many thousands of cell towers around the world in excess. With our bodies and brains being completely saturated by nanoparticulates combined with the monarch tower system, the psychotronic grid was finally completed. The US government continued on with the 9-11 false flag operation. Since everyone has a remote neural link up to the NSA's remote neural monitoring system and the other treasonous ABC agencies could get a complete audit of the American people's emotions and thoughts. These traitors criminals used a combination of hate speech propaganda blaming innocent people in which they wanted to conquer and emotion-based frequency manipulation. Our bravest patriots left to go and die for a new world order conquest and genocide to steal resources that didn't belong to us. The trillions of dollars that went missing that day on 9-11 went to the police state empowering the cows left behind to keep you in fear. From infraguard gang stalking to cyber terrorism censorship to minute false flag terrorism. 9 11, the mother of all psyops. There was an exponential rise in targeted individuals after 9 11. Mostly the people who didn't fall for the government's bullshit. And guess what, America? You're the biggest terrorist on the planet. Your tax dollars have paid for all of this. Your war on terror is just as fake as your war on drugs that the CIA imports. You fund these operations with your tax dollars. Your blind obedience and your servitude. The irony here is that the American Revolution began with taxation without representation, the Boston Tea Party. You have no say in where your tax dollars go. It's time to abolish the taxation system. It's time to evolve. Evolution begins with revolution. Where are all my militiamen? Where are all my Minutemen? Because guess what? We have a job to do. Aircraft making a condensation trail is very similar in many ways to when you go outside on a cold day and exhale, you create a condensation trail. That little cloud is a condensation trail. Now, if you take a two-mile walk on a cold day and you can turn around and you can see your condensation trail tracking all the way back for two miles, that's how crazy it is to think that what we're looking in the sky is actually condensation trails. The contrails, not the chemical, the contrails occur because of cold air, minus 30 
It takes a high altitude, around 30,000 feet plus. There's a carbon dioxide and water vapor in that exhaust. That turns to ice crystals, and that's what you see, the white stream behind it. Those white crystals of ice warm up, dissolve, and the smoke goes away. And it never lasts more than a minute. What we're seeing now, and I first could not believe it, and I started looking at the skies, and these are not normal. They're not natural. There's something going on. I don't know who it is or why they're doing it. All I can testify is it's not natural and it's not normal. It's got to be some outside influence doing that. Thank you. I'm here to give you testimony that chemtrails, they're not contrails, are indeed real. They're spraying almost every day. I watch the clouds and watch the spraying program going on. I want to tell you that we're in very great danger from the pollution that's coming down over us. And we've been led astray by the military industrial complex and they're responsible for the cloud's creation and weather manipulation programs. They're dark operations. That's why they're not out in the media. I look around and I see people are starting to look up and see this. Many times I've spoken about chemtrails and I get this blank look on my face. What are you talking about? I'm saying, look up. As a pilot, but before I fly, I look up. And so, boy, they're really out there working. When you look up at the sun and you see a white haze, that is aluminum floating in the air right now, and it's coming from the aircraft. There's a huge amount of uh, aluminum being found because these sprays have aluminum, strontium, barium, manganese, and uh, there's a lot of argument that aluminum is very common to be found, but aluminum is only common in a bonded form. It's not common in a free form, and we're finding high rates of free aluminum uh, in the soil, which is not natural. The metal compounds that are being used are environmentally dangerous. We need to be monitoring them. We need to be testing them. Okay, these previous guys, I've watched exactly what they do, and yes, they are correct. I've seen exactly the same stuff, so ditto marks on those. You want some figures? Okay, latest water test, tested the rain. 13,100 micrograms per liter of aluminum in the rain in 2013. Normally, it should be zero. So 13,100 is pretty damn much, folks. It used to be zero, then it was 100s in the 2000s, and then in, uh, since 2010, it's into the 1000s and the latest 13,100. In the snow on Mount Shasta, pristine Mount Shasta, 61,000 micrograms per liter, four times the amount that is found in the soil up there. Where in the hell is this stuff coming from if it's not coming from the soil? We have clouds in the sky we've never seen before. Almost every day I'm seeing clouds I've never seen before. And NASA has been even named a few of these new clouds. Uh, and it's, it's really interesting, but NASA is a corporation. I want you to know that. Uh, NASA has also uh, conducted a research program in what they call metallized fuels. We're actually putting aluminum oxide right in the fuel because it has two atoms of aluminum and three atoms of oxygen. So during the combustion process, it releases all that oxygen and dramatically increases efficiency, but it leaves the aluminum in the air. We got things coming from sky down, and it's a huge, huge problem. Because as it comes down, what happens is a couple of things. Is that it actually is in our air, we breathe it. And as we breathe it, it's actually going to go up through our nostrils, into our brain, easiest access to our brain frontal lobe. The contaminants that are in, that have been identified, which already been mentioned, are aluminum. Aluminum is the number one neuro uh, free radical generator to the brain to cause early apoptosis, which is early death of brain and it begins to set off the scar tissue, which we call the amygdalin, which is, a pot, which is part of the um, chemical matrix related to Alzheimer's. I'm a neurologist practicing in Reading for 17 years, and in the past five years, I have seen the number of patients with Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, and other neurodegenerative diseases tremendously increase, almost quadruple. Uh, I became interested in chemtrails about a, years ago when I was in Hawaii, and the Hawaiians are really being very vocal about it. I concur about the increase in number of Alzheimer's. They have been able to take the aluminum and micronize it, which means it'll stay up longer, but it also means 
And I don't know if any of you have noticed some metallic taste in your mouth when they're spraying. But you inhale that, it goes up through your cribriform plate and into your, through your sinuses and into the brain. As you heard, to spray nanoparticles, very small particles, these nanoparticles, they basically trigger a programmed cell death in the brain. And that is the ultimate path we see in Alzheimer's. That's problem number one, because when we look at the Alzheimer issue, we say those are the old. The real problem is, and the real scare I have, is as I am a father of two, I am a grandfather of three, so the drama is, is our children. ADD started in the 70s. Autism was not on the radar. There was no documents, there was no information. It was one in 100,000 children. Today, what we have is one in 48 boys. I was part of the early group that was looking for aluminum in ADD and ADHD. And all of those children that started to develop those phenomena had high levels of aluminum. When we figured out protocols to detox them out, to free the body of those particular contaminants, what happened is that their brains came back. When we do this to the age, it doesn't come back as quick, but it will come back. But I'm seeing Alzheimer's in 56 years old. Back in the 70s, Alzheimer's when you were 80. If you remember eight to 10 years ago, there was this big move to get rid of aluminum from underarm deodorant because it would cause Alzheimer's. <laughs> Look what they're doing to us now. I want to give you a little bit of history on the background behind nanoparticles has been described before. A nanometer is one billionth of a meter. It's very small. In fact, if you have particles, say, that are 40 or 50 nanometers across, you can take and line 50 of them up next to a single red blood cell. These things are extremely tiny. They're pervasive. The collapse and decrease of agriculture is something I worry about even more than the previous info about autism and Alzheimer's. Believe me, I'm seriously concerned with what I'm watching. As a wildlife biologist, I've been watching the ecosystem collapse. When you lose all your stream organisms, when you have aluminum overload in your streams, you're killing your microbial bacteria, and you're disrupting the entire ecosystem. So it goes way beyond just a little bit of pollution. Um, how did Monsanto know to create aluminum-resistant plants? I don't think I've heard anybody ask that question. Okay. Insects. I've done studies in Siskiyou County. They're at 20% of normal. The aquatic insects basically made a nose dive in 2006 to about 20% of normal. So far this year, I've sampled 200 trout stomachs. 98% of them are empty. So uh, sorry about the trout fishing fellows. The mayflies, stoneflies, dipteris, and caddisflies are uh, damn near gone. The terrestrial sampling is down to about 20% of normal, except for pest species like ants. Uh, we're seeing a loss of major bird species, and as the gentleman said, the ecosystem is unraveling, and Audubon's been telling you that for years. The materials that are going into the environment right now, aluminum oxide nanoparticles and barium nanoparticles, these just happen to be the same materials that they use in nanothermate explosives. And so when this stuff settles down out of the air into the environment, it is small enough to be absorbed through the root structure of the trees and the forest. And so when there's a forest fire, and there will be a forest fire, those fires burn dramatically hotter. The point is that the, the, the cost of firefighting, the cost of the, in the health care system have nearly doubled in the last 10 years. The amount of acreage is lost because of fires. The impact on human health is dramatic. I personally tested uh, water and aluminum and I found aluminum had 47 times the normal expected amounts. Uh, strontium had 10 to 20 times the amounts. Barium was 20 times. This is what the stuff looks like here. I collected it. Looks, most people just think it's a cobweb, but I tested it. It has outrageous amounts of barium, strontium, and aluminum, but they destroy the samples, so I'm not letting this get away from me. You know, these tests are international in scope. We're seeing this all over the world, guys. Okay, pH of acid soils is 20 times more alkaline. The aluminum in the soil has doubled in the last 10 years. The rain normal was 5.6, it's 20 times more alkaline. Aluminum blocks essential nutrients. I am unable in my garden to restore normal pH, and that's because nanoparticles are now in the circulatory systems of both plants and humans. 
the Air Force conducted a study starting in 1993. It was called In Vitro Toxicity of Aluminum Nanoparticles in Rat Alveolar Macrophages. That's a real fancy way of saying testing the effect of aluminum nanoparticles on the white blood cells in the little air sacs in your lung, the alveoli. And what they found in this eight-year study was that these particles, when you're exposed to them long enough, it suppresses the ability of your white blood cells to defend you from airborne infections coming into your lungs. So it suppresses your immune system. But they also found that these same particles, once they get into your system, they can actually go through the barrier in each one of the cells. They get inside the cells, and these particles can actually suppress the ability of mitochondria which are in the cells that help to gobble up toxins and things that would be harmful to the nucleus and the, the reproduction process of the cells in your body. These processes are suppressed and so essentially by breathing this material in your immune system is dramatically suppressed. Well, I wrote to the federal government because Air Force wrote a book and on the first page of the book they said we're going to control the weather by the year 2025. I asked them what are they doing spraying this these chemicals on the public. I said there's violation of United States Code 50 U.S.C. 1520, which prohibits the American government from experimenting on the U.S. citizens with chemical agents. I said that law also requires the who's ever experimenting when the federal government does it, that they have to report to Congress within 30 days. They wrote back, they said they don't know what I'm talking about. We have enough evidence that there's a spraying going all, all over the place. Um, we were warned about the takeover of our freedoms by the military industrial complex by both Eisenhower and Kennedy. They're gaining traction on us, folks. We're, we are in trouble more than just a spraying program. All I can say is it's about time we get up in arms about this because it is affecting our health. It's high time that we as citizens of this great country take action. Board of Supervisors in Suffolk County, New York, they outlawed geochemical engineering. Hawaii passed an ordinance prohibiting geochemical engineering. I urge you to bar geoengineering in Chasta County and pass an ordinance. At least ask some damn questions. What the hell is all this aluminum doing here? Why are the trees dying? Fish is dying? Why is there Alzheimer and aluminum spiking? And why are these fibers on the ground here in Chasta County? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Marmon. Today, the Chester County Board of Supervisors has been the beneficiary of some sincere, passionate, and knowledgeable comments. And I thank you for those. I am in agreement with my colleagues about sending letters and a call for action, but I would hope that we could go a step further. I would like for us to send a copy of this video where all of you spoke today, all two and a half or three hours of this testimony to be sent to our senators and our U.S. representatives we'll and, also, and also our representatives in the state of California. We'll do that. Let them listen to the passion that came out of this meeting today. Thank you. You have uh, the motion in front of you. I think it's understood. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Motion passes unanimously. <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me at all if the response is one that exceeds far the boundaries of Shasta County in terms of the platform that is offered as evidenced by those who attended today from around the world. That's very impressive.